You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 139. Today's show is a broadcast of the Financial Independence Book Club, brought to you in collaboration with Utopia Dreamscape. We discuss Get Good With Money by Tiffany Alice. We discuss envisioning your future self, anyone can start now and make a plan, finding support and community to discuss finances, and becoming financially whole by mastering the fundamentals. We also discussed the noodle budget, pizza banking accounts, updating beneficiaries on all your accounts, and switching savings accounts to higher interest banks. I'd like to thank the Sovereign Candle Collective for providing our prizes. This month, we are giving listeners a chance to win prizes. Details on how to do that will be shared during the episode. During the first part of the discussion, I bring in a surprise guest. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the episode. Now, without further ado, let's get to the show. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. Welcome and thank you for being here at this Financial Independence Book Club. This is our third one and it's a, uh, well, I personally loved this month's book. Like this has been my favorite so far. I just want to mention that this week on the Light Talk podcast, they did a special finance themed episode. And I'm mentioning that because both Amy and I have been guests over on that show. And a lot of the stuff they talked about was exactly what we've talked about in this book club. So anyway, shout out to Light Talk. Um, go listen to that episode if you want, because it's it's really good. And oh, Amy, for you, they also brought up the topic of like making money isn't selling out. It's like lighting design is lighting design. It doesn't matter if you're doing it for a highway overpass. It doesn't matter if you're doing it for this great work of art. Like it's all the same thing and everybody is doing all sorts of things. Yes, I love that. Yeah. And I also wanted to start today talking about like the why of why we do this book club just because my week has been crazy and the why has been present for me. (laughs) So first off, it's education for ourselves and for everybody that listens and, and catches this. For me, it's also part of community. I need a place to talk about this with. I don't want to be in that artsy world where we don't talk about money. And Amy, I want to give you a shout out for Utopia Dreamscape because you posted on Instagram uh, like a dividend chart from when you started investing in 2019 all the way up till today. And it's so great because like the first one is like for the year you had like 31 cents of dividend income. And then by last year, you're at like 350 or something. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. It, it's really, it was really fun to do. Um, I'm not even sure it kind of happened by accident. I was in, in mint looking at numbers and trying to crunch numbers and literally just like saw, I saw in my transactions that there, there, I was looking for something, but I found dividends is what popped up. And I was like, Oh, I never thought of filtering my dividends. And so that's kind of how I came up with it. And I was like, man, it's, you know, that compound interest, I, that's just stuff I don't even touch. It just, it's just growing on its own. So that was really exciting to see. I'll keep doing that too. And every year it's it's exponential. It was really good. So I hope that you on our next 6K update, I hope that you can do that there. Because yeah. like that that for me was like such, I think I liked it like three times, which means I liked it, unliked it and liked it again. <laughs> um, because it was just so like visceral. It was like, oh, that's really, if Amy can do it, like I can too. I was definitely like the least candidate to to be financially educated. Definitely if I can do it, anyone can do it for sure. That's honestly how I feel about this every book club. I'm like, if all of us can do it, like, then everybody can do it. Like, <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So then I want to talk about why for me, which is quality of life. And this is where I'm going to have Nicole come say hi, Nicole. <laughs> Trust me, this will this will be good. <laughs> we had Hello. a little baby this week and he came early, three weeks early, this little rug rat. Are you serious? Yes. So that's, this, that's hello, Welcome. This is Roth Ira Steimel. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is Theodore Vince Steimel. Aww. He's just another reason why it's so important for financial independence. Yeah. I now am responsible not just for us, but for us, you know. Congratulations, <laughs> you guys. Amazing. What a surprise. Okay, I just wanted to share that. I couldn't help. I couldn't help. So, needless to say, Nicole's not going to attend this book club. <laughs> Thanks for saying hi, Nicole and Theodore. Oh, yay. Amazing. All right. So that's everything that I wanted to get off of my chest today. (laughs) No wonder you've been busy. (laughs) 
All right. So, Amy, I'm now going to hand it off to you uh, to take it away for this month's book and this month's presenter. Awesome. Thanks. Wow. I'm just like shell shocked right now. That's so cool. I'm so excited for you guys. I literally, before we started, I was like, so what do you guys do? Probably any day now, right? (laughs) Oh, so exciting. Congrats. Um, I'm still going to call him Roth IRA for the rest of my life. But yeah, congratulations. That's great. So uh, let me get uh, start off by saying that we always want to share our vision and mission of the Financial Independence Book Club. So our vision is financial literacy for creatives. And our mission is to create a transparent forum and inclusive community to propel arts workers into financial security. This is a myth buster that you, ha- you can't have both. We have prizes today from the Sovereign Candle Collective. We have travel mugs and notepads. And we're going to do something a little bit different this time. We're going to put on an, a social media prize winning challenge. We'll put it up on Instagram, but you're going to like, and you're going to tag and share, and then, and then we'll pick a winner from, from that group. So along with uh, travel mugs and notepads, there's going to be a three hour session uh, in the pre studio of either EOS training, grandma training, grandma or EOS pre usage or training um, at the Midtown Manhattan office. So your choice of one of those three, either EOS training, grandma training, or grandma or EOS previous station uses or training. So that is really cool. I wish I lived in New York so that I could take take. Wait, I want to make a comment on that because I think there's a couple of people that listen and attend that are interested in this. And I will say that you can still win it if you're not in New York. And if you don't want it, you just say, oh, can you give it to somebody who's there? Or you can just wait for a time that you're going to be in New York and you can visit the office. Yeah, because we all go to New York eventually. Great point. Awesome. Um, So then I would like to talk about our book, Get Good With Money by Tiffany Aliche. One of my favorite facts about her, I loved the book. I thought it was really great. I can't wait to talk about it. She was a former teacher for 10 years with a master's degree in education. And my favorite fact about her, because she is such a giver, she gives back to the community so much. That's how this whole book came about. This is how her business, The Budgetista, came out. And she actually was instrumental in getting the Budgetista law, A1414, passed in January of 2019, making financial education mandatory for middle school students in New Jersey. And I loved finding out about that because I really feel that uh, this is so lacking in our school system. And the fact that she got it passed for middle, middle school kids in New Jersey is incredible and groundbreaking. And I hope that it sets a course for that to become true in other jurisdictions as well. Um, so very cool. Like love this author, loved learning about her and reading this book and all of the tips and tools that included. And so with that, I want to introduce Emily Crimmins, our presenter today and a dear friend of mine that I worked with years ago um, at uh, Ketra in Austin, where we did lighting together. And now now, Emily is the customer success manager at a photo booth company that specializes in experiential marketing and works with numerous creative agencies and brands. She also runs her own photo booth company called Photo Boo, where she is the lead designer. And you can rent the Photo Boo equipment from anywhere in the US. You don't have to be specific to any particular location. And I'll tell you, I've used it before. It's so cool. There's all kinds of really interesting backgrounds. You can choose from some that exist, or she can design custom ones for you. So definitely check that out. Very cool. And Emily, welcome to the Financial Independence Book Club broadcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me. And um, yeah, just really happy to be here. And it's nice to meet you, Ethan. Um, I was able to attend last month's book club session as well and read both of those books prior. So it's been a really cool journey so far. And I feel like I've been there with Amy uh, throughout like a lot of it. So it's uh, really cool to see how it's just like transforming and changing and that this has come into fruition because of it. Um, So I really appreciate the introduction. I really enjoyed this month's book as well. Um, Get Good With Money by Tiffany Aliche. I'll say her name again. Got to give her all the shout outs. Um, So first I'll just kind of go through like my summary of the book, and then I'll list out just a few takeaways and then just like what I got from the book. So like my conclusion as a 
summary, um, I would say get good with money as a practical and approachable 10 step program uh, to what Tiffany calls financial wholeness. Um, And so the steps are simple and are create a budget, save like a squirrel, which I love that she uses that (laughs) as an example, pay down debt, score high, and that she's referring to credit score, learn to invest or learn to earn, I'm sorry, then invest, get insured, grow richish, pick your money team and leave a legacy. This book really does provide a wealth of information and that pun was intended. And I like that it breaks financial wholeness up into bite-sized pieces because every step is a different chapter. And then within that chapter are different tasks that you can do. So I like that kind of setup because it kind of just like helps me tackle kind of one thing at a time. Um, Because for me, sometimes it can feel really overwhelming when I'm thinking about like the grand scheme of like my finances and what that means and all the different aspects. In my perspective, I think it could be really helpful for anyone kind of wherever you're at on your financial journey. Um, Like for me, it took me back to some of the basics, which I think sometimes I can overlook and undervalue. Um, So it was like good to like get back to that and just like keeping things simple as well. With that, my first takeaway was that financial wholeness is accessible to anyone who's willing to master the fundamentals. So like that was kind of what I took away from it. It's like, yes, it is accessible, but there is like a certain amount of action that you need to take as well to get there. And like I quoted from her book, anyone regardless of their income level or employment status can and should work towards becoming financially whole. Its principles are relevant and applicable to all. And that's on page 14 um, of the book. So yeah, I I love that approach because I think like, as you all mentioned earlier, like about just like accessibility, it's like, if she can do it, if he can do it, if they can do it, like, so can I. Um, and I really like that inclusivity. It just feels very like open and welcoming. Um, so like, I appreciated that quite a bit. The second takeaway was start now and keep going. Um, time planning consistency are all crucial in preparing for the future and building wealth was what I took away from a lot of the topics. One of the chapters, Tiffany states, It's your younger self's job to look after your older self. And this is from page 172. Um, And I love that Amy put hashtag friends with Wanda because Wanda is the name that Tiffany gave to her older self. And whenever she mentioned that in the book, I was like, oh, I love thinking about it that way. And like, it is like really true. It's like, I'm looking out for like future Emily, like right now. And I can take like certain steps to ensure safety, security, all the things, you know, also it's like life on life's terms, life happens. So then I can also like prepare like for those things I don't expect, which like as of today, I had someone like hit my car while it was like parked in the street. So it's like one of those things that just comes up and it's like, thankfully I have an emergency fund. So it's not as big of a stressor, just like knowing that my third takeaway was do the research, ask for help and keep an open mind. And maybe I snuck three takeaways into one. Um, But I feel like those kind of all go hand in hand. Like for me, it's like finances are personal, but I'm not alone in it. So like, I can seek guidance from people like that. I know I can read books about it. I can join different communities. I can attend book clubs that cover like these different topics. So that's like really helpful for me. And Um, Another quote from Tiffany was, the fastest way to achieve your goals is with support, expert guidance, and advice. The more you make or want to make, the more you'll need assistance. And that's from page 313. And I love that. You know, it's like, it's nice to know other people will understand. Like I can find a group of people that kind of, that can appreciate where I'm coming from and can also like help. And then I too can share that. Um, So that was my third big one. So in conclusion, financial wholeness may not feel easy. (laughs) I put, you know, like at first, um, but it is simple. The steps in get good with money are like an instruction guide or even like a blueprint on how to achieve freedom and security 
by building a multifaceted financial foundation, uh, no matter what your income is. I really love that Tiffany Aliche inspires readers to dig deep and think about more than just money. So that includes getting insured, like building a money like team and like seeking that expert advice on like what else I can do. Um, and then also securing your estate. Cause like, that was something I hadn't thought about too, too much, to be honest. And then when I was reading this, I was like, oh, wow. Like, and then I went into all my accounts, like assigning beneficiaries, like, oh man, I needed to like actually go check that. Cause it's like, Yes, it is like about what's presently going on, but then also about like planning like for the future. Um, and she also notes, and I love this, that ultimately a lot of your money mindset comes from remembering how truly powerful you are. And I think this kind of ties into last month's book as well. You are a badass at making money. And she said, you have everything you need. You have the tools and ability and the right to pursue the abundance that was meant for you page 28. And I just love that. And she ends the book with what I think is a really beautiful reminder that giving activates abundance. So the best thing we can do is help someone else by sharing our time, energy, resources, and knowledge with those who have less. And she says, commit to sharing your abundance with the world. We are all capable of making where we are better through conscious kindness. And that's page 337 in the book. And I just really love that she ended on that note. It's like, we can take all of these steps. We can do all these things. But I think like her and this book and just kind of like what she stands for is really about just like helping everyone get to it. And I think that kind of falls right back into like the inclusivity, like aspect of all of this and making it like accessible to multiple people and just like offering to share that with others. So I loved this book. I thought it was great. Um, I'm definitely going to loan it out. I've already told multiple people like about it, like you should read this. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to hear what you all thought about it too. So thank you so much for letting me share. Okay. I know Amy's going to talk, but I have a question, which is what is your older self name? Oh my gosh. I know I was thinking about this the other day and I was having a really hard time deciding. I was like, I kind of like Frankie. I think that's pretty cute. Um, or like Myrtle is just one that I think is really like funny. <laughs> Older lady person. You are, you totally look like a Frankie as an elder. Like, I love that. And, and Ethan, have you decided your older, your older self? You know, name? I only picked a funny one, which is Roscoe. <laughs> I don't know why. That's like a character from Singing in the Rain. It makes sense as a lighting designer as well, Jill. <laughs> That's true. That, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> okay, so maybe I'll go with Lee then. That'll go. All right, Lee go. Is, older, older me is Lee. And <laughs> I got to look out for Lee. Okay. All right, Amy, you may talk. I like it. <laughs> well, I actually haven't decided on my name yet, but it's funny because just yesterday I was telling a friend, I don't know how names were coming up, but I was talking about how like when I was a kid, I always like hated my name. It was so plain. It only had three letters and everyone else had more syllables. And, you know, I was so bored with my name. And also I was a, a go figure. I was a tomboy. Still am. Um, but I always wanted a name that was like a girl name, but had a boy nickname like Danielle could be Danny or Samantha could be Sam. Um, so I was like, oh, well, maybe I should just pick one of those for my elder self's name. And uh, so, yeah, I guess Maybe I'd be Danny or something like that. I want to put a little thought into it. But for now, I think that's Danny and Frankie and Lee. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> and yeah, she she talks about that. And I love that she brings that up because, you know, a lot of times there's all these conflicting ideologies like um, live in the now and be present. And but then it's like you. a lot of people think retirement is unattainable. And so they, and it's just because it's just a concept. And so a lot of people won't even try because they're like, how can I even do that? I'm like barely saving any pennies now. But when you put a name to it and you, instead of visualizing the concept of retirement, like, oh, I'm going to fish every day, or I'm going to like drink pina coladas on the beach. It's now you're a person, you know, it's, it's looking after you, it helped me anyway to visualize my future self a little bit more and what she would actually need and not just this like kind of random concept of retirement. So I liked that a lot that she kind of 
put it that way. And she even says like, hash, you know, put it on hashtag friends with Wanda is like a little tag that you can use on social media too, to kind of get involved with the community, which was really cute. Thinking of your older self, I think is so good. It's, it's like, I don't know. I don't do vision boards, but I hear they're super popular and great with successful people. But to me, it's like a mini vision board. Imagine that because like that, there's something about us that it's like, that is an actionable thing we can think about. Like that's something we can actually look forward to. And another thing relating to that, I'm jumping here, but for retirement, you want to save 25 times whatever your salary is. And I thought that was just a really good thing for her to say, because it did the same thing. It was like, oh, that's an attainable amount. You know, like my salary, I guess, fluctuates year to year. And it can, it can like vary between 30,000, like from one year to the next. So for me, it's like, I could pick the lower year or I could pick a higher year, but either one I pick, like that number is not going to be drastically different. And she had several of these like rules of thumb type things. And that was one that I was just like, yes, okay. So what do I need in retirement? Like, I'm always like, oh, a million dollars or two, like I just make up a number like that. But if there's a way that you want to do it without like, making a budget of your life and actually like looking at your numbers and your net worth and all this to like figure out like what you actually need, knowing that the rule of 25 is just like, oh, I just need that. So like if it's 100,000 times that two and a half million. And for me, it's like, that's the same as like thinking of my older self. It's like, oh, I can think of two and a half million. Like I can think of that number, you know, whether I only get to 600,000 is fine, but like, it's a number that is actionable. And I want to jump to the rule of 72. I don't know if anybody remembers this one. That one I had never heard of in order if this is now, okay, wait, should we talk about retirement first before I jump to compounding? No, go, go where you are. Go for it. Okay. (laughs) Um, So, okay. Obviously um, on book club, we, you know, compound interest is very important for us. Eighth wonder of the world, the doubling of money, like the point of compound interest is, is that you add more money on and then eventually your money grows and eventually it doubles and triples. And, you know, if you live so long, maybe you can go more than that. But the rule of 72 was that you take the number 72 and you divide it by 10 Wait, does anybody remember it? <laughs> well, I think it's by 12. <laughs> by 12. You divide it by 12, and then that's the number of years that it will take. Oh my gosh, I'm totally messing this up. I have to go look it up. I'm sorry. That's why we have the internet. <laughs> Rule of 72. 72 divided by the interest rate that you're earning will equal the years that it takes for your money to double. So Nicole and I, I feel like looking back at our stocks, we can sort of say that our money grows at 10%. Um, like the stuff we have in our brokerage account. So if we take the rule of 72, we take 72, we divide it by 10%. And then that's the number of years that it's going to take for our money to double. So 72 divided by 10, I think is 7.2. So in seven years, money can double. And this is another thing where it's like, when I check it year by year, this is what was so powerful about Amy posting about the dividend increase from year to year to year. Because when you look at it like that, it's like, oh, wow, there actually is a change there. And this seven and a half year thing, I can understand it. Like, (laughs) it's not complicated. I can be like, oh, wow, in seven years, in theory, that money will have doubled. And I don't know, for me, just knowing that, it's like, I always think of like, oh, I've had these accounts and they're growing, but like, they're not growing as fast as I think they should, blah, 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 blah. But then knowing like logically in seven years, your money will double. Like, because in seven years, I will totally have forgotten about this day. I will have forgotten about this book club. I will have forgotten about all of this. And so I won't be thinking of the rule 72 and be like, oh, wow, seven years ago, I had half that amount. But I like love this because it makes me want to save more. It wants me to like put money from a savings or a checkings into like an investment account because it's like, oh, that's like in seven years, I can just double my money. Like there's no reason for me not to be doubling money. And it's like just start wherever you're at too. It's like even if you can just invest like a little bit like at a time because it's like time is your greatest friend for this as well, like with the compounding and everything too. Yeah. And that's why it's never too late because compounding interest is always going to compound. Compound's going to compound. Um, <laughs> I, and I love that too, that she kind of puts walks you through the steps because, you know, she includes whether even like I listen to the audio book, but it comes with a PDF. And I'm sure this is in the, in the written book as well, where it gives you actual worksheets to work on. And what I really liked about her budgeting worksheet that was different than some others that I've seen is that usually there's just one column that says, 
these are my expenses. These are my variable expenses. These are my fixed expenses. And this is my income. And, but that is usually one single column, but she actually breaks it out into two columns. So you start off putting in your expenses, but then she has a second column right next to it so where you can adjust it. Once you realize like, oh, I'm a thousand dollars over budget. I'm spending more than I'm making. Instead of deleting that information, you actually go in and edit, where can I make changes on this? And to me, it was really powerful to see that side by side um, instead of just like editing it out and never seeing that history of when you were overspending. Her noodle budget. That's what she called it. Her noodle budget. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so great. It's super great. And just the fact that she like, like you said, the 10 steps to wholeness, she really encourages you to, it's not like a book that you have to read or maybe you read it right away, but then you can revisit each chapter. You don't have to be whole by the end of the book. She's very supportive and really encourages you to take your time through these steps and really, uh, you know, optimize each step, which I thought was really awesome too. I, I, I just love this book. I, I can't, like, I think I'm just going to save this book forever because I like getting rid of things and giving them away. But like, this book is just so digestible and so actionable. And we had an episode of Artistic Finance about Dave Ramsey and people have opinions. I have them too. But one of the strong points about the Dave Ramsey method is that it's steps that are actionable. And it's like, without fail, if you take these steps, like your life is going to be better, like your financial health is going to be better. And so for all the negatives that might be a part of that system, like overall, you're going to be great. And so what I love about this is that I'm in love with every single one of these steps. Like there's not a single thing. And there, these aren't steps per se, but like there's not a single one of these bullet points because it's just saying like, you know, this, this is what you need to know about this. Um, and can I talk about insurance? Yes, I was going to ask you. I was really excited to hear what, you, <laughs> what your response to the insurance chapter was. <laughs> so this, and this is, this is why for me, like this month, yes, I had a baby a few days ago. Like, so my life has just changed, but this book club is so important to me because it's, it's like real, <laughs> like, because here's the thing. I had a whole episode of artistic finance about life insurance. And I spent an hour and a half talking to an agent, a broker and, and learning everything there was about ins insurance. And then I was working with him to like get the policy that I need, you know, like having a kid. So I want to get it for me and Nicole. And we were like, we, we had like the study done about like, well, these are the recommended insurances. And when I was set on like getting term and life, cause I was like, you know, I'm going to cover all my bases, going to be super prepared. I'm going to get a little bit of both. And then the reason nobody does life is because it is so expensive. Like there is no reason why we wouldn't just go invest that money because for like, you're going to pay a thousand dollars or no more. You're going to pay like $2,000 a year to get $150,000 in 30 years, like guaranteed. And I know there's other benefits of it, but moral of the story is it's like super expensive. Okay. So then we're like, all right, yeah, that's crazy. Not going to waste money on that. This is why everybody does term insurance because it's so much cheaper. So for like $500 a year, you can have a million dollars of coverage or $500,000 of coverage. That's like, yes, it expires in 30 years. All right. So all this to say, and it's not just because I'm a proud father that I bought Theodore in today, but it's because like he's on my mind with this. But reading this book by the Budget Nista, we got to the insurance part and we were deciding like 20 year, 30 year, whatever. And she says, if you're under 35, which we are, we're 34. So it's like, if you're under 35, you should get a 30 year policy. Cause we had gone back between 20 and 30, 20 and 30. And then she's like, okay, well, you should do 30. And I'm like, well, we're really close to 35. So we could go, either. but then I was like, you know what? No, we're going to do the 30 year policy. We're not going to do the life insurance, um, et cetera. So I'm saying all this to say like, this book actually helped my life. Cause, cause I, we were going to go with like a higher policy or something. And then I read this and I was like, no, you know what? We don't need the life. We don't need to feel guilty about it. Oh, this was the other thing. I'm so sorry. So as part of term insurance, you can, at some point you can, you can pay for a more expensive term policy in order to change it to life later on. And that's what we were hemming and hauling over. We were like, should we like, that seems logical. Like that would be good for us to do. But with a little bit of research, and then this book is the thing that like pushed us over was like, she's like, no, you don't need to do that. Like you can invest your money elsewhere or whatever. So don't spend the extra money. So we're now going to pay less for our life insurance because we read this book. Um, and so I'm just saying that because it like actually 
did something for like a real person. Like I'm a real person. Nicole and I are both real pers- people. And now we're going to pay like, uh, like 300 less a year for 30 years for each of us. So that's $600 less a year for each of us for the next 30 years that we're not spending. And we can do something else with that money because we read this book. Taking a break from the interview to mention this month's prizes and how you can win them. It's very simple. Go to Instagram and follow Artistic Finance, Utopia Dreamscape, and Sovereign Candle. Then comment with your favorite part of today's episode. Now, you only have to make one comment, but you have to follow all three accounts to be entered into the prize drawing. And that will occur on April 18th, so be sure to do this before then. I'm mentioning it here halfway through the episode so you can do it while you listen. Now, before we get back to book club, I'd also like to mention the Artistic Finance Patreon page. This is where you can support the show and help us provide resources to others. Patrons are producers and they help pay our social media manager and eventually will pay for our editor so that I can get the task of editing off of my plate. Thank you to patrons for your monthly or yearly pledge In return for that pledge, all patrons get a private podcast feed that goes directly into your podcast player. It includes all bonus audio and early releases of each episode. Currently, we have early releases of two cross-collaboration podcasts, Show Me the Money, the Light Talk podcast takeover of artistic finance, and we have an episode of Theater Art Life discussing navigating a career in technical theater which discusses taking ownership of your career and how Gen Z is breaking down walls for pay and mental health. If you would like to access those episodes now, you can sign up at patreon.com slash artistic finance. To those that become patrons, thank you very much. It really does make a difference. And now back to the show. For me, when she talked about it, Comparing it to car insurance and pet insurance and, you know, you like she made it so plausible, like you're not going to be upset that your pet didn't, you know, get sick, that you didn't use your insurance. You're just going to be happy that your pet's fine, you know, or you're not going to be upset that you paid for car insurance and be upset that you didn't get in a car accident. In Emily's case, she's using her car like- Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that that was really interesting. And, and then it, that money that you're saving, you can invest and then you'll have the money in your, if you pass away after your term insurance has already expired, you'll now have uh, retirement accounts and accounts to pass on to Theodore or, you know, anyone in their family because you'll be doing wealth building over the time of that 30 year period. And so it's almost just like, you know, it's just risk management for a period. You don't really have to think of it as the, the end all be all, because you're going to have all of these other accounts with, with savings and compound interest that you can pass on instead of your insurance policy. And also in my brain, like money doubling every seven years, if it's invested potentially, um, it's like, yeah, $300 doubling every year is such a way better payoff than, the paying the paying the two thousand dollar a year premium to get that. Um, also, I want to point out um, for retirement savings, she said that the target should be twenty percent or more of your income, and I'm just pointing that out because, like, when I was younger, growing up, it was always like save ten percent, like was the rule of thumb. And then at some point in like the two thousand teens, maybe it went to like fifteen percent, where it's like, oh, with interest rates and blah blah blah, you should do fifteen percent. And then over the last like five years, I'm gonna say it's finally bumped up to like, oh, do 20% if you can. And she was like, yeah, 20% or more, um, which is just a good thing. And it's just because I'm saying, because I think Nicole and I, we sort of still have that 10% number in mind in our brains. And we forget that like, no, it should be 20% um, that you should be investing and saving for retirement. Yeah, I liked how she brought that up too. Oh, another thing I liked also was that she brought in experts for each of the chapters who like specialized like one person in insurance, like one person was like a like tax lawyer and like different things. And then they had like blurbs from these like experts, like in the chapters. And I really liked that too. And the insurance chapter actually like helped me as well. So it was nice. Like you said, it's like, this is, this can be immediately applicable to like your life circumstances and like things that you're working through and like helpful in the moment. And I just love that. 
<laughs> I actually have a question for both of you, which is disability insurance, because that was also in there. So we don't have disability insurance, and I wasn't planning on it. But now I'm thinking maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Do either of you have disability insurance? I have disability through work. So like one of the things I haven't done, I've looked at certain aspects of insurance and where I'm covered, but there are some I still need to look into more because she mentions in the book, you can have life insurance through your company, but it might not cover you exactly where you like actually want to be covered. And the same might go for like disability. So I'm still at that point where it's like, I know I have the coverage there, but I need to do more research and like really look into if I'm like covered. So I will be going back to that chapter for sure. Okay. Cause one thing I learned about life insurance, which is why Nicole and I are buying like independent life insurance, um, policies is because Nicole does have it, an option through her work. But the thing is, if she leaves the job, it would stop as soon as she leaves the job. Uh, she uh, she has a mini disability one as well. And I think it's the same thing. Like it stops as soon as she stops working at that job. So if any of her bosses are listening, she's going to work there for the next 30 years. But just in case, you know, life happens and she decides not to, that that's why like we're doing it on our own. Yeah, I'm still kind of going back and forth with it. I'm like actually in the middle of reevaluating all of my insurance um, because I've just made this transition where I'm working on my own. And I was for a while trying to decide if I was going to make an LLC or a nonprofit or like what direction I'm going with my businesses because I have more than one. So I'm currently actually reevaluating all of my all of my insurances and I'm moving States technically, um, which is funny to say as a nomad, but that's happening. So I'm I'm still kind of evaluating, and I've just always been on the fence with the disability insurance. I just don't. I just haven't really made a solid opinion about it. I think that obviously it's going to be really really helpful um, if something were to happen. At the same time, I'm really mad at U.S. insurance, and I just feel that it's just. Uh, how do I say, you know, like it's a racket, it's a total racket. And, you know, I just, there's so many different kinds of insurance. And if you were to get them all, um, you know, there's half your paycheck. So I, I really kind of struggle with that because of course I want to be covered if something happens, but, um, I don't know. Okay. So I'm, I'm glad again, I'm glad for this book club because after reading it, I was like, okay, maybe disability insurance is something to think about. But now I'm thinking, I'm like, well, I have life insurance. And yes, if I like both my legs get cut off or my brain stops working, like that's going to be a bummer. But like, I feel like I'm, I'm taking enough financial steps everywhere. Is that one that I really need to add on? Like, is that a bill that I need to add on? Well, and especially like in your line of work, right? Like, I mean, if you have insurance through your company, as you're a freelancer, like if I get insurance for my company, then I'm going to be covered under my workman's comp in my insurance package. So I need to learn a little bit more about what is the difference between disability insurance and workman's comp and where's that crossover? You know, is it just redundant at that point? Those kinds of, those are the kinds of questions that I kind of have because when would you actually use disability insurance where those other insurances wouldn't already be covering? Well, if you don't, if you don't quite die, and life insurance doesn't kick in. <laughs> like that's the extreme, that's the extreme example. <laughs> but work, but work, work, workers compensation, if you get injured on your job, I guess if you get injured and you're not on your job and your whatever other insurance doesn't cover it, if you fall in your home or you fall in a supermarket, there's just so many insurances already. I'm just trying to figure out what wouldn't already be in place that disability would need to kick in. And and this is also like you talk. There's so much. There's so much to finances and personal finances. And Emily, you were talking about how you get overwhelmed with it all. And I want to say that I do that too. And I think that's again why I really like this book because it's like oh, I can just go read the chapter on insurance. Like it's very easy to disseminate the information. Yes, definitely. I know it's like, and my perfectionism kicks in too. Like when it comes to like finances and wanting to feel like financially whole. It's like, I'm not doing enough, you know, it's like never feels like I'm doing enough, like in a way. So it's like hard to find that balance, like sometimes too, to where it's like, 
doing like enough so that I'm like covered, but like also kind of like taking it easy, like sometimes and like, and also just taking the time to really look into things. Cause I, I'm the type of person that I just jump into action like sometimes. And so like this book helped me with that as well as like taking a step back, like doing the research, like really, you know, looking into things. Cause when we were talking about disability, for example, it's like, oh, but then there's short-term and long-term and like, you know, like all it's like, there's two, even two different types there. And like, so it was good to like kind of read through. And like you said, I'd like that you can go back into each chapter without having to like reread the first part of the book. Like you can like jump in and just like use different steps or advice like from those specific chapters. So um, it's helpful for sure. Um, also, we mentioned the noodle strategy, um, <laughs> but does anybody remember the like uh, the pizza analogy? Refresh Nobody remembers memory. this. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I was hoping somebody else could explain it better than I'm going <laughs> to butcher it here. Um, okay. So this, so let me backtrack because it actually starts with the three different bank accounts. And this is something I feel like that everybody knows, like you should have different bank accounts to take advantage of like interest rates, et cetera. She's like, you should have three different accounts, like at three different banks. Like there's the big banks, which is like good for accessibility. They're everywhere. You can get your money out when you need to. Then there's the online banks, which historically have higher interest rates. So it's like, that's where you want to park money that you want in cash, but you want it to be growing at least slightly, but you don't like need it every day. And then also credit unions, like look into credit unions because they might help you get a, a loan or something and they're not in it to make money. They're in it to be part of the the community. So, okay. So I just need a little confession here <laughs> is like, I've had artistic finance for three years this year, just last week, Nicole and I did our taxes, right? And so I'm gathering the documents and I'm like, where are the 1099s from the bank accounts that say how much interest we made? <laughs> because if you make $10 in interest, they have to send you a 1099. So I'll tell you, TMI and Nicole, I'm sorry if you don't want this information out there, but we have a bank account with thousand dollars in it oh nicole just said ethan all right so that might get edited out <laughs> all right, we have a bank account with several thousand dollars let's say over ten thousand dollars it gave us zero interest because it, we have it in like a big bank and i know that we should transfer that over to an online bank even if to only get like fifteen dollars for the year but instead i haven't and we didn't get any money so this so again this book is like a reminder to me, like, I think it's actually going to help me because it's like, it's like the final nail in the coffin for me to be like, Ethan, you have a son and you have to be wise, like with your money that's just sitting there. I literally just did this last week. I have had accounts with Bank of America and for years and they have been hitting me with fees. Like they has not been a good relationship. It was a toxic relationship. And I like finally just transferred everything. And I had just avoided it for like years just because I didn't want to deal with transferring everything over. Didn't want to deal with updating all of the recurring like bills and like everything. And then like after reading this book, I was just like, I've had enough. <laughs> and I was just like, and then I transferred everything over. And I can tell you right now, I, it was something I'd built up in my head, like for so long and just like, didn't want to deal with, you know, but it was nice. Cause like reading that chapter, I was like, okay, like I just need to like do this and like automate everything. And so now I have three accounts, just like she said in the book, I did like two online. I already had, um, a high yield savings account, opened up another one, um, and transferred money into there for my like bulk savings. Cause it was a higher interest rate. And I closed out all of my accounts at bank of America. And then I have a bigger bank for accessibility, um, like daily spending with capital one, um, who I have had a better relationship with, um, than bank of America. So yeah, when you were explaining that, I was like, oh my gosh, I just did this within the past week. <laughs> That's amazing. And again, this is why I love being able to talk about this because uh, shout out to my sister, Susanna, because she does put her money in like a high yield interest rate. And she's been doing it for like five years. And every year, like when the rates change, she'll like text me and she'll be like, hey, look, I'm getting more or hey, what's up? Online banks are supposed to have more. And why are they cutting the rates, you know, back when <laughs> interest rates were getting cut? Um, and every time she's texting me like a snapshot of her like rate, I've always felt guilty. Like, Ethan, I know to do that. I, I know. So it's lovely to hear that, Emily, that you did the exact same thing, because we may also have that account at Bank of America. I had a, a similar um, thought about it, because 
I was keeping a large sum in my checking account and I have a lot of comings and goings, you know, because I have two properties and I have multiple businesses. And so I always like keep an extra fat, like cash cushion in there because I'm nervous, but I do balance my books every month. And I are, and I know that there's a big chunk of that never gets touched. And so I finally did move a large sum of that. I also already have a high yield savings account is where I keep my emergency fund. So I moved and I wanted to make that bigger. So I moved from my checking into that one. Emily and I talked about it last week where when she had just made her transfers and uh, where we were reading the book and I was like, you know, I should make another one that's my sinking fund. It's like money that like I want to use, you know, for your like birthday gifts or a travel fund, or it's money that you want to have access to, but it should be growing on its own. And really the checking account, it should be like the lowest amount it should be exactly what you need to spend uh, for what your, your main expenses that happen daily. Um, but then everything else should be in a, in a high yield savings for sure. And I opened my first high yield savings account right before uh, the pandemic. Um, I think it was like the end of 2019 or the very beginning of 2020. And I was very excited because I had a big percentage rate, like the percentage rates were hitting like four and 5% around that time. And they dropped to like 0.05. Like once the pandemic went into full force, uh, the interest rates just dropped like crazy. And so I was really bummed out. I was like, I just got here. Um, but eventually it's it's picked up again now. So now I think they're they're back up to between like three to five percent, which is huge. And and shout out to my sister because she had done it pre-pandemic, yes. And then they dropped and she was like, What the heck? But I'll tell you what, Bank of America is still at zero and her online bank has, you know, incrementally gone up to, you know, yeah, between three and five percent. Um, so here I am still getting 0%. Yeah. And not only are they 0% or 0.001, you know, something that might as well be 0%, um, they charge you to keep your money in there. And then they, that's what happened. That's why, uh, what was the bank that crashed recently? Because they're lending your money out, you know, and making money off of your money and then charging you to keep your money. And then they're mishandling it. And that's, that's when they go under, but I get real, fidgety around any bank that's going to charge money to keep my money in there when we're doing them a favor, letting them hold our money. This conversation reminded me of a part in the book too, when Tiffany is talking about when she was a preschool teacher as compared to when she like owned her business. And like when she was a preschool teacher, she like had her finances down. Like she was on a like lower salary, but she had all of the automation set up. She had like all of these, this money being saved every month. But then whenever she was technically financially independent, like she talked to someone about her finances and they saw how much money was in her checking account. And they were like, what is happening like here? And she was like, she kind of talked about like that, like fear of like losing it, like all too, you know? And it's like, it comes up like as, and it talks about it too. in one of my takeaways, like as you like build more wealth, it's like that feeling kind of comes like back up when, when you're on a tighter budget, you might have things a little more like worked out. Cause you're like, you know, just working on um, that noodle budget that she talks about. So speaking of noodle back to that pizza analogy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So then after she was like, you should have these uh, different accounts in the different banks. She said, then you should have two checking accounts. First is for your deposit account, your spending account, like money in, money out. Then you should have another checking account that is your bill account. That's like, this is this is for the bills. And then savings account, you should have two of those. The first one is emergency savings or short, short-term short savings. That's where you want that six months of savings to cover things if, if something goes wrong. And then there's the second savings account, which is like your goal savings. Like long-term, like that's the stuff you don't need and that's... I'll call it an investment account, but that's not right because it's your savings account too. But that's the money where it's like, okay, that's that's the money that you can save for your Disneyland trip or for your your new nomad van that you're going to need. Then she went into like automation uh, about like how to divvy all these things up, like when you get money in, um, putting stuff there. And she used pizza as an example of that, <laughs> of like, um, she was like the first slice of pizza, the one you eat right away when you get the pizza um, that's your checkings account number one. Like you need it right now. Um, then the second slice of pizza, that's the one that you drop on the floor and then the dog gets it. Um, that's, those are your bills. That's checking account number two. 
Then you get a third slice of pizza, and this is the one that you keep in the fridge for six months um, or for a week or something. Um, and that's your savings account number one. Like you need that pizza there in case you didn't make dinner for one night and you have to eat the pizza. And then the final slice of pizza is that that's the one you put in the freezer and you're like, okay, this one I'm never going to have, you know, unless whatever, or I'm going to have it. I'm saving it for the pizza party. I I don't know, (laughs) but I just, but it goes back to all her little examples of like the rule of 72 for me. That's just like once when I just did the quick math, I was like, Oh, seven years. Like that's super easy. Um, And thinking of your older self, like that's super easy. So I actually really liked the pizza example because I was like, that is so, I totally understand it. Yeah. And and that reminds me too of something else that she said that I thought was really valuable is that she says, you know, everybody wants to make more money. We always want to make more money, but, but she asks why, and I don't think anyone's ever said why, right. Or at least to me, like, why do you want to make more money? Like we all want to make more money or just be easier. We could do more things. We could this and that. And if you want to make more money, but you don't understand where your spending already is going, then you're just going to keep on being in the same situation or the same predicament. And maybe you spend more and you spend more, which has happened lifestyle inflation. It's what happens to most people when they start making money, they start spending more money. It doesn't actually solve any of the problems if you're not being mindful about where that money's going, what your budget is, how you're spending and breaking that all down. So I thought that was really important too, because that's just an assumption that we want to make more money. But, you know, another thing that I liked in the book is that she talks about different philosophies, but she doesn't try to sell you them on like she talks about fire and she talks about the snowball method and the avalanche method, but she doesn't lean you into one. She's literally just educating you and letting you make your own choices with fire. The concept is that you're saving more than you're spending. And that's, what's allowing you to retire early And so kind of that always comes back to be, you know, if retire, meaning however you want to interpret that, but that saving more than you're spending, it always kind of comes back to, to that. And you, if you just keep making more money and you don't know why it doesn't actually solve any problems. Yeah. And I love that too, because at the end of the pizza analogy, she said, all pizza is the same. It's like all money is the same. Like it doesn't really matter. And again, that's why like compared to Dave Ramsey, where it's like, these are the steps, do it this way. This is right. And this is wrong. Yeah, that's what I love about this. It's like, here's all the information. It's pretty succinct. It's it's just point blank, like here it is. This is all ag- agnostic to life and everything. Like money is just money, but here's what you need to know in order to make it work for you. Can I, I know we're running out of time. Can I, can I keep talking just a little bit? <laughs> um, okay, so assigning beneficiaries, Emily, you mentioned that, like going through all your accounts. So I have done that in years past. I've like made sure to set a beneficiary. And I don't want to get into people's personal lives, but I have a wife, a spouse, and that just makes it very easy so that anytime I set up an account, it's like, oh, it's obviously my spouse. So I think if I were single, I could see myself not having done that, you know, because it's like, well, I don't know what my parents' social security number is or whoever would be closest to me. So anyway, so I did it by default because I had somebody that I could just, I knew their info. But that being said, every time I log into the USA 829 benefits, I do not have a beneficiary set. And the reason I haven't done it is because it's like, there's a couple extra steps. Like I have to go get a form and then fill out the PDF. And then like, it's not as easy as like a five minute thing. But again, we're talking about this and now I'm like, all right, Ethan, you are going to go fill out the beneficiary form. And the other thing is I'm not vested in that pension. Okay. This is a side tangent, but that's partially my excuse. I've always been like, well, I'm not vested yet. Therefore I don't need to fill out that beneficiary, but that's wrong, Ethan. That's wrong. I need to go do it. And this book and you, Emily, saying that you went and did it all, you're pushing me to go do it. Yay. (laughs) Okay. And then my final thing, Amy, and then you can wrap it up if you want, (laughs) Um, which is just, Emily, I appreciated the pointing out of the giving activates abundance. Um, Because this, I think, goes back to you're a badass where I... Like, I feel like the response from a lot of people is like, we don't get the woo. We don't get the magic. Like, we don't get that. And I think that a lot of financial advice, like anywhere online that you get some is going to say like, oh, make sure you're giving or there's, but I'm just glad you pointed it out because going back to having a baby, (laughs) it's like people have been so kind and so generous with like advice for the baby or this or that. And it's a whole side of like humanity that I've never seen before. And so with finances, like Nicole and I, again, we just did our taxes and I looked at what we had donated and we donated, you know, a decent amount, but like, I'm like, we could do better. Like we could be better humans. (laughs) Um, And so I'm just thinking of that with that book is like, not that I need to like make it a chore to give, 
but I need to do it because anytime like I give, and I know that people say this all the time, but it's like that comes back to you. Like what you put out into the world does come back to you. Anyway, just thank you for pointing it out. Sure. Can I say one thing really fast? I know we're about to end. I just wanted to say that I love that she said it can be time, energy, resources, and knowledge, like when we're giving too. Um, so I love that she like kind of expands that idea of giving. So I just wanted to like point that out like from her book that she included that at the end, which I loved. Yeah. And I felt like that too. Like I'm glad that you brought it up as a parallel to You're a Badass because I felt like throughout the book, I was reading every once in a while, she would present something like, giving creates abundance. And I was like, yeah, she's presenting the same kind of information, but in a non-woo way where it's like, it feels like it's more practical advice and it feels more viable. So I think that at the end of the day, kind of like for me, it always comes back to, like you were saying, what you put out into the world comes back to you, like energy begets energy. And so depending on what framework you need to look at it through, I feel like they kind of always come back to this same principle. You're going to get what you give. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Should we wrap up? I guess so. Although we could keep going, but man, that that went very quickly. That was super fun. Emily, did you have any wrapping comments before we go into our housekeeping to end the show? Just that this was really great. It was nice being here with you all and getting to chat about all of this and nerd out on financial independence um, because it's great to have a community where I feel safe uh, and able to like do that and just share thoughts and goals and dreams. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. And thanks for being part of my FI journey for so long. Emily and I have been on this road together. And for a long time, we were the you were one of the only people I could talk to. And I think you mentioned that to me as well. They're just, it's very taboo to talk about money and finances, especially for women. And uh, so, you know, Emily and I have been partners in this for a long time. So it's really great that we've been able to expand this community. And I loved all the insights that you brought to the book as well. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah. So like I said, in the beginning, we're going to be giving out some prizes from Sovereign Candle Collective. We're going to put all of the rules on social media of how you can win the prizes for the travel mugs and the notepads, as well as sessions for EOS or grandma training or previs uh, in Manhattan. So take a look at social media for that. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Ethan, take it away. Yeah. So the last thing that I have to say is if you want information on our book club, go to artisticfinance.com slash book club. And there you can find information about next month's book and where you can sign up for the Utopia Dreamscape newsletter, which includes a recap of the Financial Independence Book of the Month, and it provides additional financial resources. And so the next book we're reading is The Little Book of Common Sense Investing by Jack Bogle, who is the founder of Vanguard. And this is something I'm really excited about because this book pops up all the time in like the financial podcasts I listen to, the financial blogs I read. They, this book is mentioned so many times and I've never read it. So great. This book club is making me do it. Our presenter is going to be Karima Gottschlock, who is the chief brand officer at Boisson Sips. And that's going to be April 23rd at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. London. And that's all I have. Thanks, guys. That's it for this week's episode. One thing I want to mention was a part of the book in which Tiffany talked about side hustles and creating residual income. She discussed looking like a business versus being a hobby, making a point that when you have a side hustle, be careful to focus on the income and creating systems aka customer acquisition, delivering quality products on time, etc., rather than things that aren't important but make it look like you're a business, like business cards, websites, and social media graphics. You could arguably throw a giant step and repeat into that category. I was reminded that I'm three years into producing artistic finance and it is still a hobby. It may look like a business. We've partnered with Ayrton, Live Design, and Theater Art Life, but I don't have a system in place for this to be a business. For example, if I had a baby, let's just say, the podcast stops. So even though lots of people are helping me with guest host episodes, those still take a lot of time and energy from me. As witnessed this week, I'm releasing this episode two days late because Theo arrived early. And it shows that artistic finance is set up as a hobby, 
not as a business. I wanted to mention that because it's an important point. Focus on the business, the art, the product, the creation and delivery process. Make that sustainable and automated. Don't focus on keeping up appearances. What do you think about today's book? Head over to Instagram and leave a comment, which is also the way to win an attendance prize. This month, we're opening up prizes to listeners of the show to be entered to win a travel mug, notepads, or a session in the Grand MA or EOS Previs station. Go to Instagram and follow Utopia Dreamscape, Artistic Finance, and Sovereign Candle. And leave one comment mentioning your thoughts on this month's book. Find links to all those Instagram handles in the show notes. The deadline to complete those tasks is April 18th, which happens to be tax day in the USA. Thank you to Sovereign Candle for providing our prizes. We actually have two upcoming episodes with Sovereign Candle, and those are available on Patreon. One is about pricing out a pre suite, and the other is about the benefits and drawbacks to being an artist and joining up in a collective. A note for next month's book, we have an affiliate link at bookshop.org who partners with independent and local bookstores. If you use our affiliate link, 10% of that sale goes back to artistic finance. So if you don't get the book from the library and you end up purchasing it, please consider doing so via our link, which you can find at artisticfinance.com slash book club. If you are still listening, you are what I call a super listener. And if that is you, I'd love to encourage you to get involved in artistic finance. Now, there are various ways to do this. Obviously, you can pay the fee for listening, and that is to tell someone about the show. That's the number one way that people have found out about the show. And of course, the biggest and best way to support the show is to join our Patreon page. Now, patrons are the ones who pay for the website and the hosting costs. They paid for our step and repeat. And most importantly, they support these conversations that are important for the industry. Case in point, two recent episodes have become two of our most listened to episodes. Last week's interview with Hamilton's costume designer, Paul Taswell, and last month's episode discussing liability insurance for live event production. That was with lighting designers Bill Rios and Philip Powers. Patrons made those shows possible, and in return, they get a private podcast feed, which included early releases of those episodes. So if you'd like to join up, it truly makes a difference in our budget, and you can sign up at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Obviously, if you're listening and you're not a patron, I still think you are a valuable person. I love you, and this world would not be as wonderful without your presence. Now, the final thing before we wrap up, and that is about my new baby boy, Theo. He arrived six days ago, three weeks earlier than expected. We got back from the hospital three days ago. Now, his mother, our producer, Nicole, had to stay an extra day to recover, but she is well on the mend. Talk about a badass woman. She handled the whole process with a plum. I want to give a special shout out to Carl Faber. He is a father of two young children, and he has been helping with a couple episodes of the show. He set up a meal train for us, and he has been incredibly kind and generous with his time. And he isn't the only one. Broadway designer Peter Kazarowski is helping cover a dress rehearsal and an opening night for a show that I'm designing in a couple weeks. Another Broadway designer, Jen Schriever, sent parenting book recommendations. And Maitre from Liquidify sent a children's finance book. Thank you to everyone else who has been supporting us through this process. It Takes a Village is absolutely true. It Takes a Village is absolutely true. Nicole and I are so grateful to everyone who has been so generous of spirit. The name Theodore Vince is meaningful to us. Theodore, we just like the name and it wasn't in our family tree. Vince is named after Vince Gordon, who was a director I collaborated with back in my hometown in Missouri. 17 years ago, we opened a nonprofit theater together and we produced several shows, including You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, Waiting for Godot, and Bat Boy. When I moved to New York to pursue Broadway lighting, we closed the doors on that company, but Vince remained my closest collaborator and one of our dearest friends. 
He was that person who would celebrate any career success of mine. I remember I called him during intermission of my first New York job, which was assisting on an opera at the Manus New School of Music. He was so proud that I was working in New York because I had officially made it. But alas, cancer took Vince away at the age of 28. But now we have a little piece of him living with us until we ourselves depart this world. So that's the thought I'll leave you with today. The world is a wonderful place and people are amazing. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.